The former president is also suing the co-founders of Truth Social. Wait a second. So is, is this not, Willie, is this not the Trumpiest story of all time? So, so this guy starts a company, you. goes public. Everything Trump does, you know, he loses billions of dollars, it seems. Um, and then he sues his co-founders. <laughs> this is literally everything he does his whole life. He gets a painter to paint his office. They paint it. He'll sue him and say, I'll give you 50 percent. And like he's no, just he give it, you 50%. Is, it is so sleazy. But it's money. how it's how you and I and Nick and everybody else that have, have been around him for, for decades. They all say this is how he works. Everybody that goes into business with this guy regrets it because he's a terrible businessman and he sues you. It's a reflex. If you hang a chandelier in one of his terrible Atlantic City casinos, somehow you're going to be to blame, the electrician. You're going to get sued for it. And in this case, this is a tough story to follow. So the company goes public. It gets boosted right. by his supporters. It has a value, mm -hmm. an obscene uh, evaluation, absurd evaluation because of it doesn't really have any revenue. In fact, it's lost money. So things seem to be going well. Then it comes back down to earth. <laughs> so now he's suing his co-founders of Truth Social because somehow it's their fault that it's not going well. It's, very, it's a difficult soap opera to follow and frankly, not a very compelling one either. Biden and Donald Trump neck and neck in every swing state. According to the new numbers from the Wall Street Journal, Trump leads Biden in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, and Pennsylvania by figures that are all within the polls' margin of error. In Wisconsin, the survey shows the two candidates tied at 46 percent each. The poll also finds negative perceptions about the economy remain a problem for Biden. 63% of swing state voters say the U.S. economy overall is not so good or poor condition, while 36% say it's in excellent or good condition. But when asked to rate the economic conditions in their own states, the majority of voters in five of those seven swing states say it's in excellent or good shape. Joining us now, CEO of the Messina Group, Jim Messina. He served as White House Deputy Chief of Staff to President Obama and ran his 2012 re-election campaign. Uh, Jim, as we always say, these are snapshots. The two things that I'm looking at right now, uh, obviously, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, so critical. They're all very close. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by, again, I would never guess this five years ago, that Joe Biden continues to perform best in Wisconsin. That Wisconsin of all states seems to be a uh, state. Older white guys actually uh, aren't thrilled with what, what, what's happening uh, with Donald Trump. Georgia um, uh, tighter in this uh, poll than I've seen in other polls. So I think, I think it shows, again, a good trend in Biden's direction, even though Trump's ahead a little bit. But, but this is what I want you... This is what I want. Some, some, one or two people in the Biden White House may watch this show. And this is, I want you to talk to them right now uh, on this conundrum. You go to, a, 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 and po all the polls have shown this. You go to individuals, how are you doing economic? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing really well. And then this poll goes, how's your state doing? Oh, it's doing, doing great. It's doing, it's doing really well. How's the overall economy? Oh, it sucks. I mean, this, there has been, this discordant uh, 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 sort of thinking has been out there for about six months now, where 75% of Americans say they're doing really well economically. In this poll, they're saying their states are doing really well. But you turn it to a general, how's America's economy going? And I don't know, do they just run to the ideological corners? What's going on there? And what does Biden do to fix that over the next six months? Well, Joe, you're exactly right. A couple things that I think are incredibly important. In the end, voters are going to vote in their own best interest. They always do. And it's why yes. I've, I've always been more optimistic than the polls, because voters think their own lives, their own economy, their own state economies are better than they were four years ago. And they're getting better every single day. And that's why I agree with you. In 12 polls out in the last two weeks, Joe Biden continues to have momentum since the State of the Union. You highlighted the state that I 
I care the most about, Wisconsin. Wisconsin is the tipping point state in over two-thirds of the simulations we do every night. Wisconsin decides the presidency. And once again, Joe Biden is strongest in that state for a variety of reasons that you just looked at, especially the economic reasons. 75% of the people in that state say their personal economic situation is getting better. On the national question, I do think there's several things holding over it. One of them is immigration. I think we need to address the issue of immigration and talk about it because it is something that worries voters and has them concerned. And after you get past those issues, we can go back to saying, is your life better off and how do we make your life better off? And that's a sweet spot. That's where Joe Biden, Joe, has always been the best candidate we have seen uh, in talking to these voters about their personal economic situations. So to your point, uh, former President Trump was in Wisconsin and Michigan yesterday talking almost exclusively about immigration, talking yep. about migrant crime, as he put it, telling stories that weren't true, talking about phone calls he had with victims' families that he didn't have. We can go down the list of those things. But you're right about the economy, which is the unemployment is at historic lows. Yep. Stock market seems to break a new record every week. You don't have to take our word for it. Consumer spending is up. People are spending money in this economy. So is it that question that Joe was just asking you about the, the overall health of the economy, is that kind of a stand in for how people are feeling about the state of the country or our politics or the ugliness of it? Like, how do you how do you solve that riddle? Yes. And I think it's a little bit of the stand in for voters like Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 71 percent of Americans didn't think it was going to be Trump versus Biden. And they're now starting to say, OK, it is Trump versus Biden. And that's a stand in for that as well, because that might not be their dream scenario, their dream matchup. But it's the matchup that we're going to have. And so they're starting to grapple with this. And as time goes on, my theory of the case has always been time needs to get, go on. People need to continue to feel better. The economic numbers are titching up. People's personal consumer numbers are titching up. Those are important touchstones for how they're going to vote in November. So, Jim, it is never too early to talk about 270, the magic number. No. And there's some development. Let's last... talk about the map. Yeah, let's talk about the map for a second, because there's a little buzzing about certain about Nebraska right now. The governor there has thrown his support behind an effort that would no longer allocate the electoral votes by congressional district. Because right now it's five votes there. Yeah. Typically, Republicans get four and President Biden, Democrats get the one from Omaha. That's right. If that changes and we don't know that it will, it's the state legislature is going to look at it. But if that changes, that takes away Biden's best path to win, because if you get, if he wins Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, yep. but loses the other swing states and no longer picks up the one in Nebraska, 269, uh, that leads playbook this morning, the alarm among Democrats that this is possible. What do you think? I think this is what the modern Republican Party has become. They're now changing the rules in the middle, trying to benefit themselves. This is the, the hell that Donald Trump hath wrought. Uh, in the middle of this, changing the rules 200 days before the election is ridiculous. I think you're right. I think there are real uh, simulation problems. When you look at the map, that one electoral vote really matters in the combination of other things. Then you need another state. Yeah. Um, and so the easiest pathway to victory has always been the Midwestern three states combined with Nebraska. Um, something tells me they're not going to get away with it this easy, and there will be a national outcry for trying to change the rules here. But it looks like they're going to look at it. All right. So everyone stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to continue. Hey, the jam. Uh, Jim, can I ask Jim real quickly? Did Maine give the one electoral vote to Trump in, uh, in 2020? Yes, sir, they did. So, so Trump did get that one, one say. All right, so if Nebraska goes all or nothing... Maine should just go all or nothing, and it balances each other out, right? Well, there you go. Look, see, Joe, you're fixing it right here on national TV. <laughs> That's how a Republican. Right? That's how a Republican thinks. Mm -hmm. Like, see, <laughs> see, here, you're, see, yeah, see, you're going. Oh, as a Democrat, oh, you can't change rules in the middle of the day. I'm the Republican that goes, former Republican, but still campaigns like one that goes. You know what? We'll just, uh, we'll just change. You change in Nebraska. We'll change in Maine. And then let's uh, go get a Big Mac. And uh
So, Jim, it is never too early to talk about 270, the magic number. Oh. And there's some development Let's last... talk about the map. Yeah, let's talk about the map for a second because there's a little buzzing about certain about Nebraska right now. The governor there has thrown his support behind an effort that would no longer allocate the electoral votes by congressional district. Because right now, it's five votes there. Yeah. Typically, Republicans get four, and President Biden, Democrats get the one from Omaha. That's right. If that changes, and we don't know that it will, it's the state legislature is going to look at it, but if that changes... That takes away Biden's best path to win, because if you get, if he wins, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, yep. but loses the other swing states and no longer picks up the one in Nebraska, 269. Uh, that leads playbook this morning, the alarm among Democrats that this is possible. What do you think? I think this is what the modern Republican Party has become. They're now changing the rules in the middle, trying to benefit themselves. This is the, the hell that Donald Trump hath wrought. Uh, in the middle of this, changing the rules 200 days before the election is ridiculous. I think you're right. I think there are real uh, simulation problems. When you look at the map, that one electoral vote really matters in the combination of other things. Then you need another state. Yeah. Um, and so... The easiest pathway to victory has always been the Midwestern three states combined with Nebraska. Um, something tells me they're not going to get away with it this easy, and there will be a national outcry for trying to change the rules here. But it looks like they're going to look at it. All right. So everyone stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to continue. Hey, the jam. hey, Jim, can I ask Jim real quickly? Did Maine give the one electoral vote to Trump in, uh, in 2020? Yes, sir, they did. So, so Trump did get that one, one say. All right, so if Nebraska goes all or nothing, Maine should just go all or nothing, and it balances each other out, right? Well, there you go. Look, see, Joe, you're fixing it right here on national TV. <laughs> That's how a Republican. Right? That's how a Republican thinks. Mm -hmm. Like. See, 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 you're, see, yeah, see, you're going, oh, as a Democrat, oh, you can't change rules in the middle of the day. I'm the Republican that goes, former Republican, but still campaigns like one that goes, you know what, we'll just, uh, we'll just change, you change in Nebraska, we'll change in Maine, and then let's uh, go get a Big Mac and uh, we're talk take a about break it. After Thousands of protesters gathered outside of Israel's parliament in Jerusalem for a third day, calling for early elections and a deal to release the hostages. Sunday will mark six months since the oh Hamas God. terrorist attack on Israel. And public demonstrations in the country have intensified in recent days. Israeli police say a protest last night outside of the uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's home turned into a riot. Hundreds tried to break through barriers near Netanyahu's home, but were blocked. Meanwhile, President Biden says he was outraged and heartbroken by an Israeli strike that killed seven World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. In a statement, Biden wrote, this conflict has been one of the worst in recent memory in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult, because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. He added, incidents like yesterday simply should not happen. Israel has also not done enough to protect civilians. Strong words. The strike killed seven humanitarian workers on Monday, including a dual U.S. citizen. More than 200 aid workers have been killed in the war so far, according to the White House. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu posted on social media on Tuesday that Israel deeply regrets the tragic incident and that we will do everything in our power to ensure that such tragedies do not occur in the future. I got to tell you. I'm glad the president spoke out strongly, yeah. but this has got to stop. What really does, uh, I, and 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 Richard, it's it's uh, it just uh, continues, and uh, there there's a very powerful uh, op-ed uh, dropped in the New York Times last night uh, by Chef Jose Andreas talking about how they had coordinated their movements with IDF. Uh, they had taken all precautions that that needed to be taken. And um, let me just read you some of his words. They're very powerful, strong words. Um, 
He said Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defense Forces. The Israeli government needs to open more land routes for food and medicine today. It needs to stop killing civilians and aid workers today. It needs to start the long journey to peace today. Richard, um, Israel and the supporters of Israel, uh, which I am, uh, have been, always will be, uh, will be, would be fooling themselves if they don't think that the overwhelming number of Americans agree with Jose Andreas that this is just enough and they need to focus on, on a permanent ceasefire. They need to focus on, um, need to focus on getting the hostages home. Uh, and they need to focus on creating a world uh, moving forward without Hamas. And, of course, in Israel, it will be without Benjamin Netanyahu. And maybe, just maybe then, we can take the first step of a thousand steps toward a two-state solution. Look, Joe, exactly right. There, there's so many fault lines which have emerged in the last 24 hours. Let's begin with the the. In the, the World Central uh, Kitchen uh, incident. Look, this is this didn't come out of the blue. As as you heard from the White House, you've had roughly 200 aid workers have been killed. Also, 20,000 civilians in Gaza. Put aside the Hamas fighters. Let's say approximately 20,000 civilians have been killed. What this says to me is that Israel's approach to the war simply doesn't place enough emphasis on avoiding either aid workers or civilians. And then you obviously have a question of competence here. Why is it that an identified vehicle that had been whose movements had been coordinated was still targeted? What's going on here? Could you have that degree of uh, incompetence? So either it's cavalier or it's incompetent. Neither one is reassuring. You know, and for the first time, the Israeli government reacted. They understand. They understood what a PR disaster the, the, this was and is. But that doesn't change the basics. This was not an exception. This was just high profile. I, I, Richard, and, can I can I can I stop you there? Because that is such a good point. It's not an exception. It shows that there has been, as Joe Biden has been worried about and warning about, indiscriminate bombing. These are the stories we know about. We know of, uh, about these seven aid workers, but we haven't talked about, because it hasn't made the front pages, the other aid workers that have died because of this bombing, in, uh, indiscriminate bombing in, 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 in this very tight, condensed area. It's just like the hostages that broke free from their captors, shirtless, arms in the air, doing everything they're supposed to do, and they get shot by the IDF. How many times do you think that's happened when it's not been? Israeli hostages. Sorry to speak the truth. It's just the truth. How many times? I mean, you know, I, 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 crazy me. I'm actually worried about the, the future of Israel. I'm actually yeah. worried about Americans loving Israel That's as much as I line. love Israel. I'm worried about what Benjamin Netanyahu with this offensive uh, is doing. And, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it. The more the protests rise, against Benjamin Netanyahu, and the more pressure he feels, the more uh, uh, petrol, so to speak, he throws on the flames. It's just going to happen because he knows he can't leave power. He gets sent to jail. He's so he will, he will intensify this war. He will hurt Israel's standing in the world even more. He will get us even further away from getting the hostages home, all because he's got to make himself seem like the indispensable man by creating even, even a higher stakes in this war. Yeah, look, whatever the motives, the, the prospects or the odds, of a wider, longer war went up in the last 24 hours. You, know, you had, in addition to this question of what Israel does in Gaza and how it waits going after Hamas versus getting the hostages back, and you began with the protests in, in Israel about that, the attack on the Iranian compound in, in Syria. We, you know, we can argue that separately, the wisdom of that, and I think there was some case for doing it, but it does increase the odds that now this war will grow wider, I think the chances of something with Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon and Israel go up. So what we're seeing, Joe, quite honestly, and it's tragic, 
is none of the preconditions or none of the prerequisites of a calming either in the Gaza front uh, or, or, or more broadly with Lebanon, with, with Iran in the Red Sea. The, the Middle East is like an earthquake zone with multiple fault lines. And at the moment, several of them are going off at once and they re reinforce uh, one another. So you know, you know, every once in a while you hope that out of bad news there could be a glimmer of good news. I don't see it this morning, I'm sorry to say. So John, this has obviously drawn widespread condemnation from the Middle East, from the West, the UK, the United States. We've seen it everywhere. Those vehicles couldn't be marked more clearly. We're looking at them in this video. Those were aid workers. You have other aid organizations now pausing their efforts saying, we don't know that it's safe for our aid workers to go into Gaza given what happened with World Central Kitchen. So what is the spot now that President Biden has been in for a long time, but that was made much worse by what happened? We can talk about domestic politics. We saw a little bit in some of those primaries last night. But on the international stage, what is the spot he's in right now? Yeah, to your point, those vehicles couldn't have been better marked. In fact, it looks like from the footage of the destroyed van, one of the missiles went right through the logo of the World Central yeah. Kitchen, right there, right through the logo, and just killed everyone uh, inside. Uh, and it should be noted, to Richard's point earlier, you know, this mistake hit uh, comes a day after the precision strike that killed the Iranian general uh, in, in Syria. It's hard to reconcile uh, those two things. Yes, there's real political pressure. We'll get into it a little later. But there was, again, a substantial uncommitted vote last night in Wisconsin. That's a protest vote about Gaza. You know, it's the primaries. It's, there's a belief that a lot of those voters will eventually come home to President Biden. They're not all going to. There's some real anger there, uh, and that's not going to dissipate. Um, and, and, and now, at least, we have a moment where you know, the president, and, and this has been bubbling up from behind the scenes for a while. President Biden, frankly, is furious at Prime Minister Netanyahu. But yet, still, his administration has not conditioned sale, weapons sales, conditioned aid. They haven't done it yet. Now, maybe this is the moment that comes. This also happens just, we think, a week or two, perhaps, before this Rafa offensive, which really could be a flashpoint. Okay, I'm so sick of hearing how upset President Biden is. The buck stops with him. If he wants to stop arm cells, if he wants to stop the bombs that are indiscriminately killing civilians, he can. He has the power. We don't need him going and his aides going to reporters and talking all background about how upset they are. What happened yesterday is still going to happen. When, at Mika's conference, the, uh, the head of the Palestinian Red Crescent spoke, and she was incredibly moving. This was in Abu Dhabi. And she spoke about the difficulty of aid getting in the country period from the north or south and she described a process that was kind of like the tsa changing the rules every single day going through airport security until those checkpoints are working and aid is going through we don't need to be giving any more arms sale or money it needs to stop it needs to be conditional it's ridiculous that it's going on unchecked and unfettered, and we're sitting around and talking how upset we are while we hemorrhage billions of dollars. It's the worst of all worlds right now for the president. It, the, the criticism looks increasingly empty. It's six months. We're reaching the six-month milestone of, of, this, uh, of, of this war. That, that's, that's, you know, that's one fact to begin with. And two things have happened in the last few days. One is these attacks are continuing, and yet so are U.S. arms transfers to Israel without conditions. They've been going on for six months. Where, why does Israel need 2,000-pound bombs to be used in high-density populated areas? Then, 10 days ago, what does Israel do? It expropriates 2,000 acres of land in the West Bank for settlement construction. Where is the White House reaction to that? That is how you undo even the possibility, Joe was talking about it, of one day getting to a two-state solution. If you're going to have a Palestinian state, the last I checked, states are built on territory. If the territory isn't there to build it on, you can talk about two states till the cows come home. You don't have it. Where's the administration reaction to that? So at some point, the words become empty. And the Biden administration is very close to having reached a point where their criticism of Israel is too much for the same people who criticize Chuck Schumer. But it's not nearly enough to affect the course of what is going on. That is the worst of all well, possible weak. It looks weak and impotent. You were in the HW administration at the State Department. At the White House. At the White House. What would James Baker have done? <laughs> and seriously, that's what we should be asking ourselves, because that was a moment well, when we were a diplomatic superpower. Well, so we, we confronted Israel. And if you remember at the time, Israel was subsidizing people leaving the Soviet Union. 
and they were going into the occupied territories. We basically said it's Israel, you have a, you know, you, we'll help these people to get out of the Soviet Union, but we're not going to subsidize their going into the West Bank. That forecloses options down the road. We understand you may not have a Palestinian partner today, but we want to work, we want to preserve the option for the day when we might be. And the administration basically said to the Israelis, you have a choice. They made their choices that economic consequences. This administration has got to have some teeth in it. So Jeffrey, you have a new piece for the May issue of The Atlantic that you are debuting this morning, and the title is A Study in Senate Cowardice. And you write about your interview with former Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio at the Aspen Ideas Festival, and you specifically asked him about his vote to acquit Donald Trump in the second impeachment trial, and you write in part this. On stage, Portman reminded me of his comments on the night of the Capitol insurrection happened. I took to the Senate floor and gave an impassioned speech about democracy and the need to protect it. So that's who I am. But this is incorrect. This is not who he is. Portman showed the people of Ohio who he is five weeks later on February 13th when he voted to acquit Trump, the man he knew to have fomented a violent, anti-democratic insurrection meant to overturn the results of a fair election. Portman then asked whether it asked if it would be a good idea for President Obama to be impeached by the new Republican Congress. He went on, well, he's a former president, and I think he should be out of reach. And Donald Trump was a former president. If you start that precedent, trust me, Republicans will do the same thing. They will. It was an interesting and also pathetic point to make. Portman was arguing that his Republican colleagues are so corrupt that they would impeach a president who had committed no impeachable offenses simply out of spite. So, um, Jeffrey, um, this is a, a tough piece. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an important reminder, though, about why we are where we are. Uh, the Senate could have, should have impeached Donald Trump for doing what they knew he did. They were there. They were at the scene of the crime. They spoke out against it. They spoke out against it in, in, in the most impassioned way. But then these senators, some of them who have been my good friends for 20, 25 years, did what I consider to be unthinkable. They voted to acquit Donald Trump. Um, and the question, Jeffrey, is why? Why would they acquit a guy that they know uh, uh, could have cost them their very lives and tried to foment an anti-democracy revolution? Right. I mean, the, the, the why is unknowable, uh, except to these folks in their hearts. But we have notions of why this happened, um, fear, for one thing, I mean, literal fear of uh, the same sort of mob that attacked the Capitol, attacking them physically, right? Um, they were worried about their families. Um, probably a more, a broader explanation would simply be popularity. This is where the Republican Party was going. Um, these are elected Republican officials. They wanted to keep their jobs. They saw what happened to people who stepped out of line. They saw, you know, even just their own colleague Mitt Romney being scapegoated and excoriated within the, the, the Capitol simply for standing up for his principles. And, and so they decided that expedience, I mean, they found excuses not to vote for, you know, the, 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 we don't want to set a precedent. Well, you know, it was Donald Trump who set a precedent by not leaving office after he lost. That was the precedent that was set in, in early 2021. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, the, it's, the usual, uh, it, it's, the, it's the usual assortment of, of kind of lame excuses that keep people in their careers. I, that's, that's, that's my best explanation for it. So, Jeffrey, this is, seems to me a <laughs> fundamental question of our time because it's a reminder that didn't, we didn't have to be where we are right no. now. If enough people no. took principled stand doing what they knew was right, right. and doing recognizing what they knew was wrong, which is the attack on January 6th and that Donald Trump fomented that, yeah. Donald Trump may now just be 
an angry rich guy sitting on the patio at Mar-a-Lago lobbing true social posts into the right. night, and mm -hmm. it would have been relatively <laughs> innocuous. But um, we talk a lot about Lindsey Graham on this show, who yeah. banged the lectern on the night of January 6th. I'm done. I'm out. I'm, Trump and I had yeah. a run, but it's over. He gets chased through the airport literally four days later through Reagan National Airport being called a traitor and flips. Yep. So that's the fear factor you're talking about. But that's Lindsey Graham. We understand who he is. But why didn't some of the others say, look, I liked some of Donald Trump's policies. He was a good president for one term, but we cannot go down this road. The, the interesting thing is that they did. For, I mean, if you look at the statements of so many of these senators, all you needed was 10 more Republicans to join the six Republicans and the Democrats to, to vote to convict, right? If you look at so many of their statements, they were appalled by what happened. They were in shock by what happened. But then, as you see, you know, time goes on. And three weeks later, look, Mitch McConnell could have ended this. That's right? the yeah. issue. It's, yeah. Yeah. McConnell's right. the guy. Mitch, right. McConnell, Mitch McConnell's the guy. But, but you know what? People like Rob Portman, very highly respected senator, very smart guy, very accomplished guy. If just if he had 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 built up Mitch McConnell's backbone, if he and a, and a, and a handful of these these folks had done that, you, you, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. But you know, right, Mitch McConnell is the key player. I mean, along with Kevin McCarthy and sort of going down to Mar-a-Lago. Right. But but there is this moment, one, two, three weeks after January sixth, where. 10 or 15 Republicans of high stature just could have simply gotten together and said, you know what? Thank you for your service, Mr. President. Enjoy the golf. But we're, we're totally out. And we're doing this as a group. So, okay, we're going to get some crap. We're going to get excoriated. But we're going to spread out the risk. But they, right. they, they collapsed in the face of this fear. Uh, you know, Elise, they, they, they could have also, <laughs> they could have talked about the riots. They could have talked about the anti-democratic intent. They also could have been very Machiavellian about this as they went to other Republican senators and say, and said at that time, <coughs> not only did Donald Trump foment this, this, this revolt, this riot, but he's the first president since Herbert Hoover in one term to lose the White House, the Senate and the House. This guy is bad news for us Republicans. If we, if we don't impeach him for the reason he should be impeached, he could come back and cause us to lose again in 21, which he did, 22, which he did, 23, which he did, and 24, which he will do. So, yes, they could have acted on principle. They also, if somebody had been, like, strong enough and tough enough, they could have also grabbed people and said, aren't you tired of losing? If this Lindsey Graham, if this Ted Cruz, if this whomever else, fill in the blank, isn't enough for your, your moral conscience to be moved, then be Machiavellian about it. Let's stop losing. This guy is a loser. He won one election and we lost. We got wiped out in 17. I could go down all, whether you're talking about Delaware County, uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania, whether you're talking about the Virginia legislature. I mean, I could go down all of it in 17, 18, 19, 20. The guy just loses. So they could have made that argument as well if they weren't so scared of their own shadows. Joe, it just shows, though, how at that moment, three weeks after the insurrection, feelings were so raw, emotions were so raw, and Republicans, senators were angry that their workplace had just been the site of a huge riot and they had been in danger. And the tenor was Trump is over, Trump is crushed, let's just move on on the Republican side. And so you didn't have them stepping up and you had an overestimation of Trump being gone and Instead, he's, you know, like a spider that they thought they had smashed out and he was done, but he keeps growing his legs back. And so he's back stronger than ever. And it just really was a fundamental mistake to not have the 9-11 hearings immediately after when it's fresh in the memory, because we see what, you know, how the weakness of historical memory after two, after three years and how the conspiracy theory set in. Claire, the off lead to Jeffrey's piece on cowardice is fear. And the fear still exists out there. And some of your colleagues, former colleagues in the Senate, still seem wrapped up in this rope of fear that binds them to Donald Trump. Why is that? Why is it so deep? Why is it so lasting? 
Well, I would disagree that it is as much fear for themselves and their families as it is fear of not having political power. Um, I think this whole exercise is um, exhibit A of how people's desire for power overcomes their integrity, overcomes their character. Uh, you know, Mitch McConnell thinks his legacy is going to be the Supreme Court. I would tell you, I believe his legacy will be his failure to lead at the most critical juncture in American history. That is, are we going to go down the road where presidents are going to try to use violence to fight the will of the voters? Or are we not? And mm -hmm. if you look at what happened, I mean, I know all these people. I know many of them very well. And they can't stand this guy. They know how bad he is. And if you remember, Mitch McConnell likes to brag about how well he knows politics. He gave a speech on the floor, I know my politics. Well, he misjudged his politics here because what he believed is that Trump under a Joe Biden administration would quick, quickly go to prison. He believed that the criminal justice system would do its job in a way that would minimize the possibility of Donald Trump coming back. Well, he misjudged that. We can talk about Merrick Garland and him dragging his feet. We can talk about all kinds of issues, but that didn't happen. And now you see this continued cowardice. And by the way, Rob Partman wasn't even running again. I mean, give me a break. I mean, when he, when he like crumbled about free trade, I knew trouble was afoot. And I know Rob well, I worked with him on many, many things. But this is really, really, I think, um, I think Jeffrey's article is so spot on about the lack of courage. You know, we have Profiles in Courage Award at the Kennedy Center every year. Mm -hmm. They should have a new award for a profile in cowardice. And the Senate, the Republican Senate caucus, should be the first recipient of that award. A lengthy list of nominees mm -hmm. for that prize, no doubt. The nonprofit organization Faith Forward, a group that says it is dedicated to bringing people of faith together to restore the soul of the nation, is releasing a new digital ad this morning. The organization says the six-figure ad buy is, quote, meant to communicate directly to faith voters who are uneasy with the idolatry and message behind God made Trump. That was a video from Trump supporters that depicted the former president as a messiah-like figure. Here now is an exclusive first look at Faith Forward's new ad. On the sixth day, God made all of us. God said we need leaders who can unite rather than divide, who stand on morals and values, and who don't idolize dictators and bullies. God said I need someone to protect consumers and farmers from corporate greed, workers from wage theft, students from crushing debt, homeowners from discriminatory lending, seniors from overpriced medicine, and loved ones from gun violence. God said I need someone with arms strong enough to protect the planet, strong enough to fight monstrous evils spreading across the globe. God said I need someone willing to give their whole life in service. And so President Biden answered the call. God made us all. Together, we make our democracy strong. Thank God we chose a faithful president who doesn't worship himself, nor undermine the Constitution he swore to uphold. For such a time as this, we pray to God what is true in our hearts. Four more years. Claire McCaskill, uh, a, a strong, provocative commercial, obviously playing off of the one that uh, set up Donald Trump as as an idol, uh, straight out of Jeremiah. Um, what's your thought on that ad? Well, I, I, first of all, I think it's powerful. Um, second of all, I think it, the, the Biden campaign needs to lean into every single area that Donald Trump is trying to claim, including faith. The contrast between these two men and how they live their life according to faith couldn't be more bizarre and different. Uh, Donald Trump clearly is uncomfortable with the contours of Christianity. He's never lived it. He's he's never uh, he's never looked at God's commandments or Jesus's teachings as instructive to him. He said that he didn't need to ask for forgiveness for anything. 
mean, how can you claim to be a Christian and say you don't need to be forgiven for anything? It is so unbelievably bizarre. And, you know, if, if you listen to Reverend Warnock, uh, Senator Warnock, about the money changers, and that's Donald Trump that were chased mm -hmm. out. Um, and so I, I really think leaning into his faith, leaning into immigration, leading into crime, leading in, leaning into all of the things that Donald Trump is trying to claim as his campaign foundation is the best way for Biden to hold on to the Oval Office. Yep. Uh, you, you, you know, you, the point you make is so critically important here, Claire, because Trump followers, evangelicals, will say, well, everybody's done this, everybody's done that, everybody sins, Joe Biden sinned, everybody... And yet, again, growing up in the Baptist church, what we learned, and it's, it's great, again, uh, in this time after Easter, to be reminded of it, that if you're a Christian, you believe that Christ died for your sins, and you, you need to ask for forgiveness. And, you know, that you see the bumper sticker across the South, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. That's, that is the central core belief of evangelical Christianity. I, I can't speak for other, other uh, uh, parts of Christianity. I think it's the same. But for evangelicals, it's always been ask for forgiveness. That's always at the call after you know, you go through 20 verses of just as I am. Ask for forgiveness, it will be given. Right? Donald Trump undercuts that in a way that no evangelical I ever grew up with would, would have been okay with. But when Donald Trump says, I've never done anything wrong, no reason to be forgiven, they still fall right in line and say, oh, he's the second coming of Christ. I mean, they, they idolize him, and it's, it's really, it's twisted. I still, again, growing up in the Baptist church, after all these years, I just, I can't, I can't explain it. I just can't, I can't explain it. How they, how, how they would kind of like, this is a great follow-up to what Jeffrey's Atlantic article talks about. How do these people that I know, that I knew, that I grew up with, how do they embrace a guy like this who says, no, I've never asked for forgiveness because I don't need forgiveness from God. Yeah. Claire? It's unbelievable. Well, it's unbelievable. I, I'm, 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 I'm quiet because I want to let it sink in. Um, it, it, forget all the excuses that these evangelical ministers are using you know, oh, the Supreme Court, and oh, you know, restricting abortion, and oh, he's he's not going to let people use the wrong bathroom. Forget all of that. This is a man who said out loud that he did not need forgiveness. Now, I don't know of any priest or pastor or minister in the Christian faith that would let that go and not grab onto it and say, wait, 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 wait. You need to understand the most fundamental part of Christianity, the most fundamental part. And I, I for the life of me, I mean, you know, look, overlook the adultery, overlook the sexual assault, overlook all of that if you want. But how can he not ask for forgiveness for any of it, for any of it? That's really just astounding and something that, uh, and by the way, Biden is quick to point to his faith. And by the way, Biden goes to mass. Biden knows the scriptures. Biden, he's, he's not a perfect Catholic by any means. He's not a, none of us are perfect Christians, but he understands his faith and his faith is fundamental to who he is. This is something that the Biden campaign should lean into, especially on topics like immigration. What would Jesus think? of a guy who said that these people who are desperate at our borders, desperate 
that they... Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.